All right. Hello there. Welcome to another episode of Science and Technology Q&A for kids and others. And uh, as usual, I'm happy to try and answer questions at... Uh, the questions should be of, uh, understandable by anybody. The answers can be as simple or complicated as, uh, as they end up being. Um, kind of about any kind of science, technology, mathematics, and so on. I'll see what I can do. This is a fascinating exercise for me because it's just a uh, look at the camera and see what I can say about different kinds of things. All right, we seem to have all kinds of interesting questions here. Let's start off with one from Aaron. How closely are computer clocks synchronized in different parts of the world? How do they synchronize? Um, I don't fully know the answer to this. There is a thing called NNTP, which is a network, um, a protocol for synchronizing clocks on different computers. So, okay, how does, how does a computer clock basically work? There is usually a, uh, a quartz crystal oscillator that is a, uh, a thing that is sort of an independent clock that runs on every computer. How does it work? Um, what it is usually is a very tiny crystal of quartz that is being electrically kind of um, uh, pushed in and out and it's kind of oscillating and it has a certain characteristic frequency on which it oscillates. It's kind of like if you have a pendulum the pendulum, depending on its length, will have a certain natural frequency that it goes back and forth at. Um, and it's the same kind of idea when you have this little piece of quartz crystal, which is uh, electrically stimulated and it goes back and forth at a certain frequency. That kind of oscillator keeps time reasonably accurately, but it gradually drifts. The only kind of way that we have of keeping time that we think of as perfectly accurate is based on the properties of atoms. And a given atom has so-called spectral lines, which are uh, basically, well, let me, I'll try, I can try to explain that. Essentially, the, um, uh, there is for any given atom of a certain type, like a cesium atom, for example, cesium is a gas, one of the elements, uh, but it could be an oxygen atom, anything else. Uh, any given type of atom has as a, a certain a set of, of frequencies of light that it produces. And it's a fixed, discrete set of frequencies. And those frequencies can be computed from quantum mechanics. And for a given kind of atom, it's always the same. So you have a, a certain cesium kind of a cesium atom with a, a certain isotope of cesium. And if it sits there, it, you know that a particular transition, a particular uh, kind of light that can be emitted when the cesium atom goes from one energy level to another will be a fixed frequency, always the same. Okay, so that is the way that the most accurate atomic clocks, that's kind of the idea that they use, is to use these, uh, these frequencies of, of emission of light, um, the, the very specific frequency of, 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 uh, of light that's emitted, um, actually, they, they use, they, they don't, I think, use visible light, but they use, um, uh, they use the fact that there are fixed energy levels, fixed frequencies that occur in particular atoms. And that's the idea of atomic clocks. They were invented in the, I think, in the 1950s or so. Um, and that's the way that the most accurate timekeeping is done because, uh, and, and so what, what can go wrong with an atomic clock? You've got a cesium atom, it has this particular frequency of oscillation, effectively, this particular transition frequency. The only thing that can go wrong is things as a result of properties of space-time. So, for example, if the cesium atom is going at a high speed, there will be time dilation, and that means that the, the effective rate of the clock running will be slower than it would be at rest. Uh, that's one effect. That's an effect that's seen in the GPS satellites, for example, that have accurate timing in them, but the GPS satellites are moving rapidly in orbit around the Earth. And so the effective rate of the clocks is slightly slower than it would be on the surface of the Earth. The second effect is gravity. Gravity uh, tends to, let's see, in a, in a um, high gravitational field, a clock will run relative to uh, the running outside, the clock will run faster relative to the rate it runs outside. Um, 
And uh, so again, that's a phenomenon uh, called gravitational redshift um, that uh, causes clocks to run at a different speed when they're in, in gravitational fields. Actually, in our theory of physics, we can give a pretty intuitive explanation for this phenomenon of time dilation. Here's, here's roughly how it works. The, when you think about a clock made of atomic transitions or whatever else it is, that clock in our theory of physics is ultimately made of some huge number of atoms of space that are all being updated according to some computational process. And the rate of updating according to that computational process defines the passage of time. So if a certain number of computational steps have been done, that corresponds to like the passage of one second. Okay, so that's if a thing is just sitting somewhere and it's just updating itself, after some number of updates, it will have a second of time will have passed. Now let's imagine that the thing is moving at some speed. It's got to, it's got to, then it's got to do two things. It's got to update itself to, to represent the passage of time, and it's got to rearrange itself. It's got to reassemble itself at a different position in space. Because in our model of physics, all of the, the what the universe consists of is just this giant collection of atoms of space and connections between atoms of space. So when you have an object that exists in one place, it's made from some complicated tangle of atoms of space. When it moves to another place, what's happening is that that complicated tangle is getting reassembled in that other place. It's kind of like what happens, at, I don't know, a wave on, a, on water. It's not that the individual molecules of water are moving with the wave. It's that the effect of the wave is being, is being transported and new molecules are taking on the shape of that wave. And so it is, I think, with everything in our universe, as I move my hand around or whatever, it's, it's being recreated with new atoms of space every time I move it. And so what happens to a, a clock is you can kind of have a trade-off. The, the clock has a certain amount of computation that it's doing, and it can either use that computation working out what its, what its future will be evolving through time, or it can use that computation reassembling itself in a different place in space. And so when you are moving in space, you're sort of using some of the computation you would otherwise be using to progress in time. And so effectively, you run time slower because you're using some of your computational effort to move in space. And it's the same with gravitational fields. The presence of uh, gravitational fields are associated in our models with essentially a higher density of updates to, this, this, to the network that represents the universe. And where there's, where there's a higher density of updates, effectively time is, is, is progressing more quickly. And that's kind of the intuitive explanation in our models. It's never been really been possible to have an intuitive explanation like that before of these phenomena, but that's sort of the intuitive represent, uh, uh, explanation of, the, of these um, uh, phenomena of, of the way that time is affected by, uh, by velocity or by, by gravity and so on. Okay, so the original question was asked about synchronization on the internet. There is an atomic clock, I believe it's in uh, Colorado, Colorado Springs maybe, maintained by the National Bureau of Standards, National Institute of Standards and Technology nowadays, that is kind of the central clock that is used to kind of define uh, sort of now for the internet. Then there's this protocol, NNTP, that distributes those now moments to different computers and resynchronizes the quartz oscillator clocks on those computers. Now, it's a tricky business because how long does it take? When the clock says it's now precisely noon or this particular time in this particular place, um, how, uh, how does one get that information about when when that happened to clocks in different places around the world. Here's why there's a problem. The problem is, imagine that you sent a radio signal. Well, the radio signal will take a certain amount of time to arrive because the speed of light, the speed of radio waves is only finite. It's uh, light goes about 186,000 miles per second or about uh, um, in, it goes in one billionth of a second, it goes about one foot. Um, so to get across the earth, uh, so how do you get a signal across the earth? Well, a typical way you would do it nowadays on the internet is with fiber, is through the, the backbone of the internet is mostly fiber optics, which means it's, it's light traveling in, in glass uh, because that's what fibers, glass fibers of, of fiber optics are. 
and the refractive index is around 1.5, I think. What that means is that light goes about one and a half times slower in the fibers, in the glass fibers, than it does in, in free space, in a vacuum, for example. So that means that the, the, uh, the, the sort of synchronization time is sort of speed of light uh, uh, times 1.5. So it takes at least tens of milliseconds, if not, uh, so a hundredth of a second to maybe even a tenth of a second, I'd have to do the arithmetic to work out exactly how long um, to get a signal. And, and, and perhaps it takes even longer because when you're sending a signal through the internet, the signal may have to go through repeaters. So it may go through a stretch of fiber that's uh, a thousand miles long going across the, you know, some, some ocean or something. And then when it gets to the other end, the signal is, goes into a piece of electronics and that electronics has to retransmit the signal again. And that might take another, I don't know, a few milliseconds or something. So in general, it could take, it's not untypical for the so-called ping times uh, across the internet to be half a second, 500 milliseconds. The ping time is the time it takes. Uh, if your computer sends something to another computer uh, saying to the other computer, uh, hello, are you there? Then there's a, it, it is sending that signal out through the internet and then it gets a signal back from that other computer saying, oh yes, hello, I'm there. And, and generally, you know, when you send packets out on the internet, there are these different kinds of packets that get sent out, like for a website, it's TCP packets, and for, uh, for, for um, streaming video, it's usually, I think, UDP packets. The, the difference is like a TCP packet, it has the feature that, that the, the, uh, the web server kind of knows it was received. It has a, a handshake, it has a, a return it, 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 it gives information back that yes, it was returned. Whereas if you're streaming a video out and a few packets get lost, well, they get lost and you don't really want to have that, uh, oh, you need to retransmit them and so on. That's a bad idea. That part of the video has already happened. There's yet a different kind of packets, CMP packets, I guess, which are the ones that are used for, uh, for things like ping messages uh, where a computer is just saying to another computer, hello, are you there? Um, and anyway, that, that, the typical ping times across the whole internet are, are on the order of hundreds of milliseconds. So, okay, so how then does the synchronization work? Well, it's a little bit tricky and I'm not sure I know all the details of it, but you have a, that sort of central clock that's saying now it's noon. And then you have to be able to make sure that another, that your computer, which is uh, let's say two tenths of a second away in ping time from that uh, central clock that it knows when that when that central clock said it was noon, even though it gets that signal 200 milliseconds later. And I believe the way that's done is the sort of back and forth signals, which are used to try and compute what that delay time is and correct for it. That's a confusing thing because one of the features of, of relativity theory is that one assumes that the maximum speed of any uh, of any transmission is the speed of light. And that's kind of what leads to the whole structure of relativity theory. But in a sense, by saying, oh, we're going to uh, set this up so that we correct for the transmission delay, you're essentially denying relativity theory. You're saying, no, actually, we're going to make it be as if we were transmitting information instantaneously. Now, the reason why that there isn't anything sort of wrong with that, why that doesn't violate relativity theory, is that what's happening is it's just a clock. It's just saying, now it's this time, now it's a second later, now it's two seconds later and so on. And so you can independently work out what the clock is going to do. If the clock was generating the most creative sort of, uh, I, uh, it, was, it was generating its creative poetry or something where you couldn't readily predict what would come next, then the strategy of saying, let's correct for the transmission time and let's make this seem like it happened at at the at the moment that corresponded to that particular time won't work because you won't be able to make that prediction. But because it's just a clock, you can make that prediction and you can get things synchronized. It's um, the infrastructure of the whole uh, synchronization of the internet is, is a little bit rickety, I would say. It's not as robust as it might be. And it's fairly important um, that it work correctly because an awful lot of things nowadays depend on time comparisons like did this come in before that thing? Did this, uh, you know, something like, I don't know, the blockchain, for example, it's very big on, on what was the order in which these things were put on the blockchain. 
and things like, and what, were the, what was the time stamp at which this occurred? So it, it's fairly important to maintain sort of the global time of the internet. It's an interesting question when the internet is, is more widely used uh, sort of interplanetarily, how that will all work, because the time on Mars, for example, might be 20 minutes delayed relative to speed of light from the time on Earth. The time on the moon might be a second or two delayed relative to time on Earth, when in the sense that when you send that signal, it's like it will arrive, it will, the speed of light is such that it will arrive, uh, let's say a second later or on Mars, 20 minutes later or whatever else it is. And obviously on Mars, because it's, orbit, it, it's, um, it's orbiting the sun like the earth does. And there's a, a huge difference in if the Mars is on the opposite side of the sun from the earth or the same side, the distances are very different. And so the time delays are different. It's not so much for the moon because it has a, a fixed distance more or less from the earth. So there, there are very tricky issues about what on earth will be the synchronized time uh, when, when there's a Mars colony and, it, and it's trying to decide what its, uh, what its time should be and so on. Um, that, that's, a, that's a tricky issue for, um, for the future. All right, let's see. Oh boy, there's another one from Aaron here uh, about scar tissue. How does the body know when to create scar tissue? Does the body make different scar tissue based on the tissue it's repairing? I don't completely know all the answers to this. The, um, uh, what happens you know, when blood clots, for example, it, um, so what, what, what happens is there's a, a whole sort of chemical reaction that starts to occur when sort of blood is exposed to the outside air and you get a cascade of things, which I think leads to this thing called fibrinogen, which is a, a, a long scraggly molecule that's, that's kind of long and gets tangled up and what starts the process of clotting and what starts to turn the liquid blood into something which has this long polymer, this long molecule that, um, uh, that sort of uh, can, can knit things together. I think in um, the question of, of how tissue regenerates itself, uh, people study different kinds of uh, critters like amphibians, for example, can regrow limbs, which we humans cannot. Um, and uh, there's sort of a whole question about how that works and how does it know what it should grow, so to speak. And that, that relates to the whole question about how do things grow in the first place. The, um, there is a fair amount known about that. The um, uh, actually, okay, so, so in a first approximation, if you wanna know uh, kind of what shape will something grow into, how is that kind of, how is that defined in the, in the organism? Um, you can see other indications of, of how things grow by asking what pigmentation pattern gets produced on the zebra or on the, um, uh, or on the mollusk shell or whatever else it is. Well, the, the most common mechanism for defining kind of how things grow is the diffusion of small substances. I guess classically they get called morphogens, although there are particular substances like retinoic acid, for example, vitamin A is one of the ones that's involved. And what happens is these are comparatively small molecules and there will be a source of this substance uh, somewhere in, the, in a growing uh, organism. And over that substance will diffuse a certain distance. And it will, it will then, and as the concentration of that substance goes down, you'll, you'll have something where things grow until the concentration of that substance goes below a particular value, and then things will stop growing. And that's kind of the typical way that sort of the architecture of, uh, an, uh, the, well, one, one level of the way in which the architecture of the organism gets laid down. So the most basic thing is you have, sort of the, the, um, the substance is emitted somewhere in the tissue and then it kind of decays down as it gets further away just uh, by the process of diffusion. It's kind of like the molecules are just doing random walks and uh, they, they get to a certain distance on average after a certain time and so on. The other effect is reaction diffusion equations where you're having this diffusion process and you actually have multiple chemicals and they are reacting with each other and there is a characteristic set of patterns that you get from this process of reaction and diffusion. And remarkably enough, those patterns look very much, they are the patterns of stripes and spots and things that you often see on organisms. 
Those are the result of essentially a reaction diffusion process uh, together with something what leads to discrete stripes, for example, on a zebra, is that although there is a continuous variation of these particular substances as you go across the zebra, for example, the, um, uh, there are particular um, uh, processes that start up or shut down depending on whether the concentration is above some critical level or below some critical level. There are some genes usually called the homeobox or Hox genes that are very much uh, related to this whole question of, of above a certain level of, um, uh, of concentration of these morphogens then grow tissue and below that level don't grow tissue. And so that's kind of the, the sort of the first approximation how you start getting uh, particular growth patterns. Um, there are other kinds of things that happen. There's lots of kinds of places where there's folding of, of tissue that gets produced, where something will grow out in a certain direction and then will, will sort of grow out so far that it has to fold over. Uh, there are other places where you'll get, um, uh, you know, every, every, every piece of every organism kind of had to grow to be that way. And so it's an interesting thing to kind of catalog the different forms of growth. You know, you have a, a horn that's growing. And for example, one side of the horn at the base, the horn grows at the base of the horn. And one side of the base of the horn may be growing faster than the other. And that means that side is going to involve more tissue than the other side. And so the horn will curl over because that the side that's growing more will be longer than the side that's growing less. And so that will make the horn go in a spiral eventually. Um, and then there are all kinds of different mechanisms, like, uh, for example, our, our fingers are produced by a kind of flat uh, uh, plane of, of tissue that originally gets produced, and then the tissue in between the fingers dies. Um, so it's a, it has sort of a programmed cell death, and that's how we go from sort of having webbed, webbed hands at some early stage of fetal development to having fingers. And there, there are all these different mechanisms that get used. But... This question of if a piece of organism is damaged, how does it repair itself? Uh, these mechanisms of morphogens and so on, for us mammals, I don't think operate after fetal development. Whereas I think for amphibians, they are still operating, even in, even in adulthood. And obviously, if you're an amphibian and you go from a tadpole to being a frog, there's all kinds of dramatic uh, kind of rearrangement of, of tissue that's happening in the process of doing that. So I think the, um, this question of how, how a piece of tissue uh, figures out that it should grow more of a particular kind of tissue rather than another kind, this, is, this was a long time mystery. I think it's gradually becoming clearer how that works. What are, what are different kinds of tissues in us? You know, every cell in our bodies has the same genetic code. It has the same DNA in it. It has the same set of instructions for how to make uh, make the organism. And the question is, why do some cells uh, become pieces of bone and some pieces of muscle and some nerve cells and so on? This is the process of, of differentiation um, in, uh, in biological organisms. And there've been all sorts of theories for that. I think it's becoming a little bit clearer how that works. And I think it's, it's to do with um, uh, sort of things outside of the genome that are affecting which genes are actually going to be expressed. So what, what's happening is you've got you know, 6 billion base pairs, maybe 30,000 different uh, genes. Each gene specifies, make this kind of protein, make uh, assemble these amino acids into this molecule. And there are 30,000 different kinds of molecules that, that uh, we make actually more than that, but that's the number of genes. Um, the, um, and the question in any particular cell if you're a hair cell and you're making a piece of you know, keratin or something, then you need to be concentrating on, on having the, the keratin genes be active and producing, producing protein from that. If you're a, a muscle cell, then you're gonna make actin filaments and then those have to be the active things and so on. And so the question is what switches on and off those different genes, those different uh, pieces of protein synthesis from the same DNA program that exists in all our cells? Um, and uh, the, the, there's been sort of a, a long story of, of trying to understand how that works. The thing that can happen is uh, when you have a, uh, okay, so once you have a differentiated cell, the general thing is that once you're a hair cell, you're not going to be able to produce cells. Even if you replicate, even if you divide, 
the things you divide into will also be, let's say, hair cells or something. You won't be able to go back from having a hair cell to having a, a heart tissue cell or something. Um, that was kind of the, the conventional wisdom about how things work. And, and if you imagine an organism like us, you know, we start from a single cell and then we divide and eventually we have uh, a few trillion cells. And each of those cells has a certain lineage. It, has a, it came from other cells that were dividing, were dividing, were dividing. Uh, the maximum number of, of sort of maximum depth of divisions is about 50. Um, but our cells sort of divide starting from this undifferentiated beginning and then eventually uh, divide into some will be nerve cells, some will be, will be uh, you know, muscle cells, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That sort of plan, that process of differentiation, there's a whole kind of chart, I think still incompletely known for humans, about exactly how all these different types of cells, these some number of hundreds of types of cells, maybe more than that, maybe it's thousands, some, how these different types of cells all arise in the kind of lineage, in the, in the genealogy of cells in the human. And so that's, that's some, uh, and, and this process of how does it differentiate? How do, you, how do you get from one kind of cell and how does it start turning into another kind of cell? And then you can't go back is the general point of view. Now, there is this notion of stem cells, which are so-called pluripotent stem cells, stem cells that have all the power to do anything, the power to turn into any kind of cell. And people had thought back, I don't know, 20, 20 years ago or more, that only in, at the fetal level do you have stem cells that are capable of turning into anything. But then people figured out how to take sort of any old cell and turn it into more or less any old cell and turn it back into a cell that was capable of differentiating into anything. And that's an important idea for trying to do things where you will reconstruct some tissue by saying, let's take one of your cells, maybe it's even a skin cell or something, turn it back into a stem cell and then have it differentiate again and turn into a pancreatic cell or turn into a heart muscle cell or something like this. Um, but that's some, um, uh, but the question of, of how uh, you get there from here with how, the, how, how a cell that is sort of embedded in an existing uh, organ manages to know that it should be of that organ, it's presumably the result of these kind of diffusion processes, these, these same kinds of things like morphogens, but I don't know exactly how that works, and I'm not sure it's known how that works. Uh, okay, let's see. Um, let's see, a question's here about, oh boy, all kinds of interesting ones. All right, there's a fairly simple one here from Roku asking, what is the meaning of light years? So that's pretty simple. One light year is the distance light goes in a vacuum in one year. And so light goes uh, in, a, in a billionth of a second, light goes a foot. So that tells you that, um, and there are a useful fact to know, there are about 30 million seconds in a year. So that gives you, um, that will tell you it's um, uh, about um, uh, 30 million billion feet is how far light goes in a year. So for example, the sun is about eight light minutes away from the earth. That means that it takes light about eight minutes to go the 93 million miles to the sun. It takes light about four years to go from the earth to Alpha Centauri, the nearest star other than the sun. Um, so light years are just a measure of the, of the distance, of, of distance, how far does light go in a year? How big is the universe in light years? Um, well, let's see, I, I always remember these particular numbers and I have to do a little bit of calculation to figure out um, how this works. So here's the, here's the calculation I would, I would do. Um, the, uh, let's see, light goes um, three times 10 to the eight, 300 million meters per second. And there are three times 10 to the seven uh, seconds in a year. So that means that the, um, uh, that's 10 to the 16 meters is one light year. Uh, just doing that multiplication, three times 10 to the seven times three times 10 to the eight. If I got that right, 
boy, I used to be so bad at arithmetic when I was younger. Um, I now, relative to the rest of the world, I seem to be, uh, either I've gotten better, which I don't think I necessarily have, or the rest of the world has gotten worse. But, but if I'm not mistaken, uh, we're three times 10 to the eight times three times 10 to the seven, you add the exponents, that's 10 to the 15, and the three times three is roughly 10. So that's about 10 to the 16 meters for a light year. And so the universe is about 10 to the 26 meters. That's a one with 26 zeros after it, meters across. And so that means that the universe would be about, um, uh, in, would be 10 to the, uh, would be about um, 10 billion light years across. Um, so that, that gives uh, some, some sense of, um, uh, of that. Um, Okay, let's see. Uh, there's a question here from Baker about, can I say anything about this year's Nobel Prize on complex systems, any relationship to what we're doing? I suspect you're referring to Giorgio Parisi, uh, who's somebody I've, I've known, but not terribly well for many years, a physicist too, who won the Nobel Prize this year. He's a very fine physicist. Um, I think the, um, uh, I have to admit, I haven't read the, the precise description of, of uh, what the prize is for, but one thing that Giorgio Parisi has worked on a lot are things called spin glasses. I can at least tell you what spin glasses are and, and how they work. So, okay, first, first comment is, uh, well, spin glasses are, uh, emerge from a, from a study of uh, how things like magnetism work in things like crystals. So back in the 1920s, people were trying to figure out when you have a block of iron and it's magnetized, how does that work? And what, what happens is there are these basically atoms in the iron that are like little tiny bar magnets. And the question is, do they line up or do they not line up? And when the iron bar is magnetized, what's happened is that all those tiny little bar magnets associated with each different atom, they're all lined up. If you heat up the block of iron, you eventually get to the, the Curie temperature, which I'm not sure that was named after Pierre Curie or Marie Curie. Um, but anyway, maybe Pierre Curie in that particular case, um, the husband of Marie Curie. Um, the, uh, anyway, the Curie temperature is the temperature at which uh, an, a block of the Curie temperature for iron, for example, is the temperature at which all those atoms, even if they were lined up originally, you'll destroy the magnetism of that thing, that there will be no net magnetism in that thing. Um, and, that, uh, uh, and that, so if you take your, your magnet and you, you heat it up, eventually it will lose its magnetism. And that happens at a suddenly at a particular temperature, just like suddenly at a particular temperature, water will boil or ice where, where all, the, all the molecules of water are all nicely lined up in a crystal, ice will melt and the molecules will just sort of be freely floating around in a liquid. It's the same kind of thing with magnetism. There'll be a critical temperature at which the, instead of all these magnets being lined up, they're sort of all randomly arranged. Okay, why do the magnets line up? The reason the magnets line up is because when you have two bar magnets, and they're very close to each other, there is a tendency for those bar magnets to line themselves up, for North Poles to line with North Poles, South Poles with South Poles. If the magnets are sort of close enough together, and if there isn't too much kicking around from heat, then the magnets will tend to be lined up. And there was a description of that that was um, uh, invented, it's thing called the Ising model, I-S-I-N-G. Um, the uh, actually invented by a, a guy called Lenz. Ising was his student who worked out the details of, of how this model works. Um, but the model just says you have these spins, these, these ways of making atomic magnets, and they have a certain, if they're lined up, if two of them next to each other are lined up, they have a lower energy, they are there, basically they want to be lined up. If you, if you put them the opposite way around, they, they will want to flip around and, and go to that lower energy state. So the Ising model is this mathematical model that describes, uh, that, that gives, assigns a sort of energy to any particular configuration of, of these spins of atoms. And it was then worked out that when the temperature is low enough, when there's 
very little randomness when there's a little randomization in those orientations of those of those spins then they will all tend to line up and you'll get magnetism because magnetism comes because all those little tiny atomic bar magnets are all lined up okay so that was the theory of 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 ferromagnetism standard kind of magnetism that exists in a block of iron or a rare earth magnet like a gadolinium block of gadolinium or something like this um, there are other phenomena, like another phenomenon is so-called antiferromagnetism, where instead of all the, all the um, atoms being lined up, they're alternately lined one way and lined the opposite way. That's a different, different case. Um, and so there's, a, a, there's a, a different, a variant of the Ising model, which describes antiferromagnetic materials rather than ferromagnetic materials. And it has a slightly different energy function that describes what the energy associated with neighboring spins being in different configurations is. Okay, so that's the, the story of the Ising model. So the, the, the Ising model has the feature that at a given, below a certain temperature, the ground state, the lowest energy state will consist of all of the, all of the spins being lined up. In other words, overall magnetism, ferromagnetism. Okay, so it's then sometime, oh, when was it? Probably the 1950s, 1960s, people started looking at materials that weren't as well organized as just having all these spins all lined up, uh, like in a crystal, for example, and being able to compute, be, saying that the energy between the spins over here was the same as the energy between the spins over here. Instead, they looked at spin glasses. Okay, what is a glass? So in a crystal, the defining characteristic of a crystal is that the atoms are all lined up in a very organized way. So for example, in a salt crystal, sodium chloride, it's a cubic lattice. So the, the roughly the, the, the sodium and chlorine atoms are arranged on uh, uh, in particular places with respect to cubes. So it's this giant sort of cubic array of atoms um, that make a salt crystal. And even the outside of a salt crystal will tend to be a cube because the atoms are just arranged in a cubic fashion in the salt crystal. So that's a crystal is something where the atoms are arranged in an extremely regular way. And there are a limited number of possible arrangements that atoms can have in crystals. Okay, a glass is a solid material but where the atoms are not arranged in a regular way like that, the atoms are just sort of thrown together. It's like in a giant ball pit of atoms where all the atoms are just sort of randomly arranged. Um, that is how a, what, what the arrangement of a glass is. Uh, actual glass is, is silicate, a silicon uh, uh, with, with the atoms sort of arranged randomly like that. So when you have the atoms arranged randomly like that, it's no longer the case that you can say that the uh, the sort of if you if you had magnetic spins at each of those places, it would no longer be true that the um, uh, that that things would line themselves up. The atoms are not all lined up. The energy functions associated with these magnets, neighboring magnets in one part of the material, wouldn't be the same as the energy functions associated with with neighboring spins in a different part of the material. Instead, it will be this much more random arrangement of oh, in this place it's good to have these spins lined up. In this other place, it's good to have the spins be anti-parallel and so on. And in general, you, could ha you have this kind of random energy function in different places around the material, reflecting the fact that the material itself is not a nice lined up crystal. It's an amorphous material, a glassy material. So what a spin glass is, is something where all those energy functions are kind of randomly picked at different places in the spin glass. It's not the case that all of the energy functions, are, all of the things are all the same, so that the thing is just a regular thing where there's just a bunch of ferromagnetism. So then the question is, okay, if you look at a system like that, uh, and you look at it at low temperatures, for example, what, what arrangement will those spins actually take on? And, and how, will they, how will they be arranged? Well, that's a hard thing to know. And one of the things that can happen is, that you end up with a very large number of different, completely different configurations of these spins that all have the property that they have about the same energy. So you have a, a, a very large number of possible states of the system, whereas in an ordinary ferromagnetic magnet, the lowest energy state is always all spins are all lined up. Um, for a spin glass, there may be lots of different states with lots of very different complicated arrangements of spins that may all be, yes, this will be the lowest energy state. 
So now you might ask the question, well, if you take an actual spin glass material, you've got it heated up, you cool it down, what actual configuration will it take on? Of those infinite number of possible low energy configurations, which one will it actually take on? And that's a complicated question. And it's a little bit like if you are a mountainscape or something and you're rolling a marble, let's say you have a model mountainscape and you're rolling a marble down the mountainscape and you ask in which valley will that, mount, will that marble end up? Well, it depends. You know, if it started rolling this way, it may go to that mount, it may go to that valley. Let's say there's a crater in your mountainscape. The marble may get stuck in that crater, even though there was a much lower valley somewhere else, there may be a hill between that crater and the lowest valley, and that marble may never get out of that. It may never go down to the lowest valley. And so that's a thing that can happen in spin glasses. There are many metastable states. There are many local minima, places where the, the configuration of the spin glass gets stuck and it can't reach the, the true minimum energy state. Um, so typically, th that's a problem that happens in a lot of situations where you've got this kind of the analog of a mountainscape, and you're trying to find where's the absolute lowest point on this landscape? How do you get there? And the usual strategy, so-called gradient descent, where you just say, from wherever you are, follow the path that takes you the most quickly down the mountain, so to speak. Well, that strategy will often not work, and you'll just end up getting stuck in some local minimum in some place where there is a path. If you, if you could find the right way to go, you'd be able to get down to a much lower energy configuration, much lower place on the mountain. But you can't, by just using that strategy of always go down the steepest, uh, the path of steepest descent, you won't be able to get there. So there are various tricks people invented. There's one trick called simulated annealing, where basically what happens is you let things that you kind of imagine going down the mountain, you know, always in the, uh, the steepest path. And then you add some random noise, you add some temperature, you kind of imagine it's a marble, the marble is just rolling down, but then you shake everything. And then so you shake the marble out of that local minimum, and then it will tend to go to a lower minimum and get to something which is a better configuration. It's a little bit analogous. If you have a bunch of, let's say, uh, balls, uh, or let's say you have coffee beans, and you say, are you going to be able to get these coffee beans to pack in the best possible way? Well, for spheres, okay, for circles, you just take a bunch of coins and you push them together, the coins will take on a hexagonal configuration as soon as you push them together. For spheres, there is a closest packing, the so-called Kepler packing, where you just arrange spheres in this particular way that people tend to arrange spherical fruit in grocery stores. There is an arrangement that is the closest packing, was finally proved to be the closest packing uh, a decade or two ago after many hundreds of years of people assuming it was but not knowing for sure. But anyway, that particular packing, if you just take a bunch of spheres, a bunch of balls, and you kind of push them together, that's not the packing you'll get into. You'll get into a packing where things have lots of holes and, and they just you can't, just by pushing, pushing, pushing on the sides, things will just be stuck and you'll never get to that lowest configuration. It's very similar to the marble just gets stuck in that local minimum and never goes to the global minimum. So in fact, that's why when people are trying to, I don't know, pack coffee beans and so on, they'll, they'll, you know, they'll bang them because that's sort of, that's like simulated annealing. That's kind of like randomizing them again so that they don't get stuck in those local minima and they can get closer to this closest packing idea. So anyway, in, in a spin glass, uh, you get these all these local minima, you get all these kind of almost lowest energy states and so on. And it turns out one of the phenomena that happens is that if you ask the question, what kind of a mathematical problem is it to find the minimum configuration of a spin glass? It turns out it's a mathematical problem, so-called NP-complete problem, which is equivalent to lots of other mathematical problems. So another, another example of a problem that it's equivalent to is the so-called traveling salesman problem. So imagine that you have a bunch of cities, let's say, I don't know, all the capital cities in Europe or something, or all the capitals of the US states. And let's imagine that you're going to fly a plane between all those capital cities. The question is in which order should you visit those capital cities in order to end up having the minimum total distance of plane, uh, plane distance flown? And that turns out to be a difficult problem. You can clearly answer the question by trying all possible arrangements of those cities. So if there are n cities, there's n factorial arrangements. So let's say there were 100 cities, there'd be about 100 to the power of 100 um, different possible, possible orderings of 
the um, uh, of, of, of which, which order you could visit those cities in. That's an absurdly large number. And the question is, can you in practice find a faster way to get to the thing which is the best, the shortest path? That problem turns out to be equivalent to the problem of finding the ground state, the lowest energy state of a spin glass. Um, by the way, as a practical matter, like in Wolfram language, we have very efficient algorithms for solving the traveling salesman problem. And even though probably in principle, there is some configuration of cities where it would take this sort of exponentially long time to find the answer, in practice, it can usually be done rather quickly using the kinds of algorithms that we have. Uh, it's a sort of typical feature. How that plays into things like spin glasses, of, you know, can you find a good minimum usually quickly, even though the official sort of lowest point is really hard to find. That's a complicated question, I think, improperly worked out at this time. And in general, the question, so spin glasses are this sort of random arrangement of, of, of energies and asking the question, how does, how does that, um, uh, you know, what, what kind of uh, energy minimum do you get there? Uh, there's other kinds of problems. Even if, if you even take the Ising model, the original ferromagnetic model, and instead of saying, that uh, I mentioned there's both ferromagnetic cases where two spins want to be aligned and the anti-ferromagnetic cases where they want to be anti-aligned. Even if you make that a little bit more complicated and you say there's a little template that says around this place, I want my Northeast neighbor to be up, my Southwest neighbor to be down, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You make a slightly complicated template of what you want. Even in a case like that, it can be very hard to figure out what the ground state of the system is. It's sort of an interesting problem. I've been hoping somebody's going to solve this for years. It turns out that problem, I mentioned that the, the, these problems about spin glasses are equivalent to a traveling salesman problem. Another problem that this stuff is equivalent to is the problem of tiling. So you can ask the question, given you have these tiles of particular shapes, or more to the point, let's say you have square tiles and the tiles have colored edges, and you say, I want my tiling to be such that the red edges always line up for these tiles and the green edges line up and so on. You try and make an arrangement of tiles that covers the plane. You might say, well, it'll be straightforward to do that. If I, if I see these tiles, I'll be able to just say, oh, I can line them up this way. I can do the jigsaw puzzle this way. It turns out that that problem is very hard. It turns out that's another one of these to know whether you can tile a region, just a size, a particular size region, a size N region, let's say, is something which can be exponentially hard. Um, and so you, you can imagine, well, how do you tell whether you can tile it? Well, you can just try all the possibilities. You try this kind of tile here, then this one here, then this one here, and so on. You try all the possibilities. Well, the, one of the issues with tiling is this. Let's say that you're, you're trying to figure out, can you tile something with these particular set of tiles? Well, you, you tile something in some particular region, it can be really difficult to figure out whether it can tile in that region, you might have to try all these possibilities, but then let me make it even harder. Let me ask the question, can you tile the whole plane, the infinite plane, can you tile, will this tiling just go on to infinity? Will it, will it, will it arrange, will there be an arrangement that uh, successfully satisfies the constraints of the tiling going off to infinity? So that problem is, so -called, is a so-called undecidable problem. It's a problem where you can't guarantee that a computer in a finite time could ever answer that question. Clearly, if you just think about actually doing the tiling or trying all the possibilities, even worse, but just doing it, you can say, well, let's start tiling and we keep going and we've tiled a size 100 region. Now we've tiled a size 1000 region. Can we go, can we keep going to the size 10,000 region? Or will it be the case that at the size 100,000 region, suddenly we get stuck? and we can't tile any further. What is known is that in principle, you can end up tiling arbitrarily far to the million, million, millionth size region, and then oops, you're stuck. There's no upper bound, there's no limit on how far you might have to go to know whether you're going to get stuck. In practice, actually, I've been actually rather recently looking for looking at some of these tilings where it can be the case that there is a very simple set of constraints on the tiling, but where the only way to tile is with some ran random looking arrangement of tiles. Um, it's something I had found uh, back in the 1990s. I had found some examples where you could end up being forced to have not a periodic kind of crystalline like tiling, but a kind of nested fractal like tiling as a way to tile the plane. That's also how things like Penrose tiles work, although they have different shapes rather than different matching conditions for the tiles. But that's a case in a spin glass 
or even in one of these sort of junior spin glasses where things aren't sort of randomly arranged, but where you have these definite kind of templates for different, uh, different spins, one of the things that happens is the problem of finding the ground state of a system like that is equivalent to the problem of tiling an infinite plane. And that problem is undecidable. So what that means is for a computer to figure out what is that ground state, what is that lowest energy configuration could be arbitrarily difficult. So, so one, one place where that's interesting is if you have a physical system, where you just say, I'm gonna cool it down, I'm gonna see what state it goes into. Well, maybe you can actually use that as a computer. Um, as, a, as a way to, to do a pretty efficient piece of computation, because we know if we were doing it from the computational side, that it takes a lot of computational effort. And in fact, one of the strategies for making quantum computers is based on this kind of annealing idea, um, the spin glass annealing idea. Um, and it's, it's, so what you do is you sort of encode a particular, let's say traveling salesman problem or something like that in the arrangement of, of the sort of, of the, of the weights of the of the um, just the particular energy functions for different parts of this spin glass thing, and then you say, okay, let me actually get this this arranged thing and let me put it in liquid helium or something, make it very cold, see what arrangement it takes on. It won't really solve the problem, I suspect, any faster than you could by just doing the computation. But it's still, as a practical matter, you know, in principle, it won't do that. But as a practical matter, it might be an efficient way to find, find results. And by the way, this question of sort of what's the minimum energy configuration of things is also essentially the question that you run into in the training of neural nets and machine learning and so on. Let's see. So that was a... Uh, little bit of description about spin glasses. Um, there was a question here. Let's see. Oh, there's a question. How do messenger pigeons find their destination? Well, there's some amusing theories about this. The question is, if, so I remember from years ago, a study that actually says pigeons actually follow roads to a large extent, or at least to some extent. They have kind of a, a, a pattern of, of terrain that they're looking for, and it might include roads. They don't read the road signs, I think. Um, but uh, the, um, um, I remember many years ago, I was learning to fly small airplanes. I haven't done it in years and years and years, but, but this was in, a, in an earlier time. And one of the solutions for if you're completely lost is fly down low enough that you can read the freeway signs. And that's a way to find out where you are. Um, I don't think pigeons do that because I, I don't think they can read. But um, I think that the, the sort of pattern of roads is, is thought to have a relationship to how pigeons find terrain and so on. Now, the... Um, uh, the other thing pigeons are able to do is they can sense the Earth's magnetic field. Just like if you have an old fashioned compass, which has a magnet and the magnet, the, the north pole of the bar magnet points towards the Earth's north magnetic pole somewhere up in northern Canada. Um, the, um, the, the, that's the, um, uh, you, you can navigate, you can know which way is north on the Earth by looking at the Earth's magnetic field. But your average um, critter doesn't have a way, it doesn't have a little compass in it, doesn't have anything magnetic in it. We don't have anything in us that is magnetic, so far as I know. And um, uh, so there's nothing that's sort of going to be kind of, at least in a first approximation, there's nothing that would kind of turn around like a bar magnet does to show you which way is north in magnetic field. Okay, but pigeons may very well have a mechanism in their brains that can in fact detect magnetic fields. And it's a rather subtle mechanism that makes use of, of very detailed quantum effects in, and it actually is making use of the, the, this notion of atomic spins that I mentioned in connection with ferromagnetism, that they essentially have, the, the thought is that they have some molecules in which there is a, a, an atom that has a spin that will tend to be aligned or not with the Earth's magnetic field. 
So for example, when we have proteins, proteins are what we're mostly made of other than water and so on. Proteins are these arrangements of amino acids, just these sequences of amino acids defined by our DNA. And, but proteins, those amino acids contain hydrogen and, and carbon and oxygen and nitrogen, I think phosphorus and sulfur, but that's about it. So if you want to have a piece of iron in your body or a piece of cobalt or some other element in your body or a piece of iodine, you don't get to have that made in a, a protein. A protein itself just consists of these amino acids. There are 20 kinds of amino acids. They each have this different arrangement of atoms, but they're all very, they're all just atoms of those particular kinds of, of chemical elements. So in order to have something like hemoglobin, the, uh, the substance in our red blood cells that uh, allows us to, to capture oxygen and transport it around the body, in order to have something like hemoglobin, you have to have a protein that somehow has to wind up with an iron atom in it. And the way it does that is that it makes a kind of cage, the protein, the other kinds of, of atoms make a kind of cage that's exactly the right size to fit an iron, uh, uh, an iron atom into. And so then just sort of, there's enough iron kind of floating around that whenever there's an iron atom that kind of gets near the piece of hemoglobin, oh, it goes in the hemoglobin and it gets stuck in that cage. And, and, and we have the same mechanism, for example, in the thyroid gland, using that for iodine, for example, vitamin B12 uh, is, is, uh, has cobalt in it, um, same kind of mechanism, this kind of caging an atom of a different type. So I think the way pigeons do it is they have a cage. I'm not sure what kind of atom it is. Maybe, maybe iron, I'm not sure. Maybe cobalt, I'm, I'm not sure. One of, one, of the, uh, one of the atoms that has a, um, a, a large, uh, so iron, cobalt, nickel are the three elements that have uh, uh, that act, whose atoms act like bar magnets, the three most common elements where the atoms act kind of like little bar magnets. Um, there are other elements, the rare earth magnets, gadolinium, europium, samarium, uh, I forget the others. Um, gadolinium is the most common one. Those are even more intense magnets because their atoms have an even larger little bar magnet, magnetic, uh, uh, act like stronger bar magnets. But so the idea, I think, is that in pigeons, the, the, the theory is there's sort of this cage, this, this atomic scale cage that has an atom and that atom tends to get lined up with this magnetic field and the properties of that somehow that, that, that protein has different configurations depending on the arrangement of that atom inside. And that's a phenomenon associated with quantum mechanics that that can happen. And it's a place where potentially one is effectively seeing the effect of quantum mechanics in the uh, in the sort of the magnetic sensitivity of the brains of pigeons. Now, it's an interesting question. If it works big time for pigeons, does it work smaller time for us humans? And is there a possibility that us humans are actually sensitive to magnetic fields, even in a small way? And I have to say that for me personally, I I, um, uh, I have in the past often found, if ever I touch a strong magnet, I get this weird tingling in my fingers. That's such a strange thing. And I've tried to make sort of a scientific study of this phenomenon. Actually, my, my children have tried experimenting on me in various ways and the experiments are rather inconclusive. Um, it's not impossible that electrochemistry of nerve cells can, can be sensitive to magnetic fields, but it's a little odd. Um, and. Uh, I think, um, uh, but so, so I think the, the, the one still doesn't know whether humans, how sensitive different aspects of humans are to magnetic fields, but pigeons do seem to have a way to sense the earth's magnetic field, which helps them in, in finding their way when they're not uh, just following the roads and so on. Um, huh. Well, there's a question from Asa here, how to fix dizziness on a boat? Oh, you know, it's a funny thing. I mean, I, uh, what is car sickness? Why does it happen? What is, what is motion sickness in general? There are different kinds of motion sickness. There are different kinds of motion. For example, in, a, there, there's, in, in three dimensions, there's, there's basically three kinds of motion. Rolling, rolling, twisting around like this. Pitching up, um, you know, uh, sort of front to back. And yawing, going side to side. And those, those different kinds of motion are, are characteristically different in different 
kinds of uh, transportation like cars, I think are mostly rolling motion. Um, I think uh, boats are mostly pitching, I think, and airplanes are mostly yawing. Um, and, and I think that the, so the, the first question is, how do we, why, why do we even get motion sick? What, what, what's going on? Well, first question is, how do we know which way is up? How do we know, how will we know how we're moving? Well, one way we know how we're moving is because we can see the, the horizon, we can see the scenery, and we can see, oh, the scenery is moving around in this or that way. And so our brain can figure out, okay, if the scenery is moving that way, that means we must be moving sort of the opposite way, so to speak. That's one way that we know kind of which way is up and how we're moving, but we have another mechanism for knowing it. And it's the confusion between these mechanisms that causes motion sickness. That other mechanism is inside our inner ear, there is this arrangement of this, this so-called labyrinth. So it's an arrangement of three uh, tubes, uh, all at 90 degrees, and they, they're three tubes arranged, uh, the circular tubes, and those circular tubes contain little tiny uh, sort of calcified things called ooliths, um, nice word. And these, the ooliths are like little tiny rocks. And as you move around, as you move, those gravity will make, or, or acceleration, will make those ooliths move around in these, in these um, semicircular uh, uh, canals in this, in this labyrinth. And so what happens is that as you turn your head, as you tip your head, you end up with those little tiny, tiny rock-like things just dropping as a result of gravity in a particular direction. And because you have these three different, uh, different um, uh, uh, circular things at 90 degrees to each other, you get to see in sort of X, Y, and Z coordinates, you're getting to see which way are you moving. Okay, so how is the motion of the hair of, of the um, of the oolith detected. The answer is there are hair cells um, that line the edges of that semicircular of that canal, and as that little rock moves, it's it's sort of poking it's 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 pushing its way through those hair cells, and what happens is it's, it's the same mechanism as in our inner ear. There are hair cells, and those hair cells have the property that they have as they are mechanically bent that generates a uh, voltage, an electric, uh, electrical signal. And that electrical signal is then passed to a nerve. And then it goes, in the case of, of, of hearing in our ear, it goes to the auditory cortex. In the case of uh, balance, in the case of, of, this, uh, of this sort of motion of, I mean, by the way, it's worth remembering that biology tends to use, take one idea and use it in lots of places. So this idea of have a hair cell and, uh, detect when the hair cell is deformed. It uses that both in our ear for hearing sound and in another thing in our ear, in this labyrinth, in these semicircular canals for hearing, um, for, for detecting uh, orientation of, 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 the, um, of one's head. And so what tends to happen is the, 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 the cause of motion sickness is that the signals going to one's brain from the motion of these ooliths don't agree with the signals going to your brain from what you see with your eyes. And so your brain kind of gets confused and the way it signals that to you is, well, how can it signal that to you? It doesn't, uh, it's hard for it to have a way to form the thought, oh, I'm moving in an awkward way. So it just makes you feel, uh, feel sick in some way. Um, and, that, um, and that's kind of the, uh, uh, that, that seems to be the origin of motion sickness um, is, that, is that mismatch. And I think the, uh, depending on, uh, you know, when you get labyrinthitis, for example, when you get a, an infection uh, that causes inflammation in those canals that can prevent the oolus from moving through, and then you can have a, a loss of your sense of balance and you can be very confused. Another thing that can happen is those oolus can just get stuck in some configuration. And there's this absolutely bizarre medical thing that um, I, I've done it once. It's just the bizarrest thing because it's bizarre because it works. And, and the bizarre thing is that you, uh, the question is, can you unstick the oolith that is stuck in the wrong place in, your, in this canal in your inner ear? And the answer is, well, yes, you can. You just put your head in this direction, that direction, that direction, in this strange sequence of motions that just unsticks based on the actual geometry of what's happening in your inner ear can just unstick the thing that got stuck in the wrong place. 
and what is it called? It's uh, something or other maneuver. Oh my gosh, what's it called? Um, anyway, it's, it's, always, it's always one of those things where you kind of look at the diagram, at least for me, you look at the diagram and it's like, you do this, you do this, you do this, really? And you know, how could something like this possibly work? And it's like, you've been, you know, it, it's been, you've been having, uh, you know, balance issues and then you do this and then up, oh, it's all solved in a few seconds. It's just one of the strangest things. It's kind of like a, a, a bug in us as a medical system that happens to be a very easy bug to fix. But anyway, the, the, the basic cause of motion sickness is this mismatch between sort of the signals from your balance organ and the signals from your eyes. Now, what can you do about that? You know, I found personally, uh, I've been curious for a long time how I can sort of deal with this. And I, I um, uh, usually when you're driving a car yourself, for example, you get less motion sick because you are actually, your eyes are actually looking at the scenery and you're not, you know, it's not, you're not sort of getting confused based on little pieces of scenery um, mismatching with what, what your ears are telling, what your, your, your balance organ is telling you. But, you know, I, I, I got these weird uh, kinds of glasses that um, I, I, I found at some, uh, probably at the Consumer Electronics Show one year, which are these, these strange glasses that look totally ridiculous, but, but um, that have kind of fluid in them uh, and on the, on the sides of one's, uh, in one's peripheral vision. And the fluid always is just because of the way that, that fluid level works, they're always, they're, it's always, uh, it's always in, in the sort of parallel to the, um, uh, it, it always is like at sea level, so to speak. It's always, it's always oriented so that it's, it's, it's flat, so to speak. So if you, if you turn your head, that fluid will sort of tip down in these glasses. And the idea is to give you a sense that the, uh, that sort of the, the ground is really oriented in the same way that gravity and acceleration and orientation of your head goes. And so that's one possible scheme for sort of un, un um, uh, for sort of unconfusing motion sickness and it seemed to work fairly well for me. I discovered another scheme is, and this is, I think these are very personal idiosyncratic kinds of things. You know, I found if I'm, if I'm listening to music, which I don't usually do, but uh, with headphones and things, then that's another way that reduces motion sickness for me. And um, a, a third thing that people often claim is that there are these, um, uh, if, you, if you wear these things on your wrist, how could that have any effect on motion sickness? But it is, a, it is a feature of our brains. You know, what, what is our nervous system doing when we ha have a lot of sensors on our skin um, that, uh, uh, that are figuring out, you know, are we, are we touching something with our finger? You know, oh yes, there's, there's sensors in our finger that go to our brain that tell us, yes, we're touching something there. We have all these different sensors and our brain has to make sense of all this different data that's coming in about, what's happening from these different nerves. And when we sense pain, for example, that's a place where there's some receptor that's saying, typically that's saying something bad is happening here. Tell the brain something bad is happening. And, uh, we, and that is perceived by us as some kind of pain. So that turned that that can happen when there's like tissue damage or some, or some pressure somewhere or whatever else. So, so anyway, that, then um, the, the question is, can we, with all of these signals coming in from all of our nerves, uh, can we somehow confuse the brain or reorient how the brain is receiving those signals? And so there are all these techniques like acupuncture that involves sort of uh, putting needles in that, that, uh, that um, uh, activate nerves. And there are these things where you have sort of pressure in some place that activates nerves. And it's, it's a, uh, there's kind of a, a lot of um, some science and a lot of kind of uh, experience and, and folk medicine and so on that's gone into figuring out these questions about uh, how can you kind of confuse the nervous system to the point where you conclude something different, like you're ignoring the, the signal from your ears because you're getting the signal from this, from this pressure in your wrist or something. And it's very weird that something like that would be possible, but all these nerves come into very similar areas of the brain 
And there's sort of an issue of how is the brain interpreting those things? And so you can potentially sort of scramble its interpretation or unscramble its interpretation, depending on how you're looking at it, by doing those kinds of things. Although it's, it's one of these things where I suspect it kind of works for some people, doesn't work for other people, hard to know why, what's going on, uh, difficult to sort of unravel what's happening. Let's see. Um, we should probably wrap up soon. Um, let's see whether, huh, a question from Aaron. Was I ever bitten by a pigeon as a child? I don't believe so. Don't know. Um, oh, there's a question from Asa. Is there a difference in accuracy in the sensing magnetic field depending on whether there's just one bird or many flying together? Um, the sensing magnetic field, I think, is very much a one brain of one bird type effect. The whole question of birds flying together on formation is a very interesting and, and complicated question. I mean, the birds can fly close enough that they're actually using the wingtip vortices. So when they're, when they're flapping their wings and so on, they're, in general, when they're getting lift to, um, uh, to keep them, keep them uh, flying, uh, they're generating vortices in the air. They're generating, they're, they're making the air sort of spin around in a spiral behind the, behind the tips of their wings. And that having that air spinning around a spiral means that it becomes easier for the, for the guy, the bird behind you um, to, to fly. And so birds often make use of that kind of, um, uh, that in, when they fly in formation. The question of, of how do they decide what formation do they fly in? And, you know, you see these kind of V-shaped formations and things. And um, I have to say, I'm reminded of, of a long time ago when I was researching some things for my um, big book, New Kind of Science, um, the uh, 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 just a just a funny story here, but but um, you know there are these V-shaped configurations that geese and things like that tend to make, where there's one leading goose at the front, and then there's a kind of whole arrangement of different um, uh, different birds behind. Um, the um, uh, um, and I think the um, um, uh, so I had. I had, I had seen somewhere, I think, that there could be arrangements where it's not just one kind of V, but where you have little sub Vs behind that V and um, uh, where you have maybe a nested pattern, a Sapinski pattern or something made up from these geese. And so I was thinking that would be a very interesting effect. And I was trying to sort of catalog these effects. And so I asked somebody, uh, actually a person who's, who's a senior person actually at our company now to, um, uh, to look into this, and and uh, so he he described it as the ultimate wild goose chase of looking for patterns of uh, you know these nested patterns in the flying of wild geese. We didn't find any, but anyway, this whole question about how the formation of the of the of the birds actually works is an interesting one. There's kind of a model usually called Boyd's, invented by a, a chap I know called Craig Reynolds, uh, who who mostly invented it for for making realistic flocks of birds for movies. Like I think he worked on the Batman movie and it has a bunch of bats in it and they're sort of flying in formation. And it's a question of how do you model that? And so he has this very simple model where a bird senses only information about neighboring birds. And then the question is what kinds of configurations will tend to happen? And when the leading bird turns, how does that affect the other birds? And you, and you see that in birds, you also see it in, the, in, the, in, in fish. Uh, you know, you can see these very dramatic things with tuna and things like that, where there'll be a huge number of fish all going in one direction. And then suddenly somebody decides, oh, let's go a different way. And um, uh, the, um, the thing that um, uh, is um, um, uh, the, the question of, of um, sorry, just a second here. Yeah. Um, the, um, uh, the question of, of, um, of how that decision is made by this school of fish or flock of birds and so on. Interesting question, actually, a person I know is researching that for sheep and she's found she has a, uh, there's a, there's a I, I refer to this as a, as a project with legs, uh, more particularly about, let's see, how many is it? Maybe 200 and something legs, because that's the number of, of total number of legs of all the sheep in this particular experimental sheep facility somewhere in Australia, um, where all the sheep have been tracked. And there's a question of what determines who's the leading sheep. 
and that's that's a case where you can do it. It's more difficult for birds or fish because it's harder to put trackers on birds and fish and so on. Although I have to say, I would I would have thought on fish you could like paint QR codes or something on the fish, and have them. Um, a fish probably wouldn't even mind. Um, and then you could you know have them tracked in a scanner, or you, or you could even use facial recognition for the birds or the fish. I mean, to us probably to me all the fish would look the same but just like with humans um if you know once you're tuned into uh uh different faces um you realize the faces are slightly different so maybe somebody could do that experiment that way of figuring out for example if you have a school of fish is it always the leading fish is there an alpha fish that is always going to be the leading one i don't think so i think it i think with the sheep apparently it changes around which is the leading sheep um, so kind of the notion of they're all being led like sheep, there's a leading sheep, because otherwise the sheep wouldn't go anywhere. Um, and, uh, and, and so this question of, of what, what determines who's the leading bird, who's the leading fish, um, interesting question, don't know the answer, um, but that's, um, uh, but so I, I think this question of, okay, all the birds have decided they're gonna go in this direction, how do they make that decision? Is it one bird, how does it work? Interesting question, whether that has lessons for us humans is an interesting further issue. All right, we should probably um, uh, wrap up here. Uh, thank you for lots of fun questions today. And I see we've got tons more. Sorry, I should, uh, these questions are, are um, sometimes a bit complicated to answer, but um, I look forward to, um, uh, to doing this again next week. So thanks very much and uh, 